Last Sunday, we focused on the credentials for a credible, prophetic, and apostolic ministry. Our theme today is the kind of leader God wants for us. In the gospel, Jesus felt compassion for the crowd who were like sheep without a shepherd. In the first reading, Jeremiah proclaimed woe on the bad shepherds and declared God's promise to raise good shepherds for the people. God is the true shepherd, and the psalmist says, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The concept shepherd in Hebrew, roe or poimen in Greek, and pastores in Latin or pastor in English, figuratively refers to a protector, a ruler or leader of the people. The shepherd, therefore, is a pastor, a leader and protector of the people. But God is the ultimate il buon pastore, the good shepherd whom all leaders must imitate. In the first reading, Jeremiah prophesied against the shepherds of Judah during a very turbulent period. He saw the collapse of Assyria and Egypt and the rise of the monster Babylon that will swallow Judah. King Josiah had begun the religious reforms, but his predecessors will return to sin and idolatry. So in the context of chapters 21 to chapter 23, verse 8, Jeremiah prophesied against the kings of Judah. And in chapter 23, from verse 9 to 40, he prophesied against the prophets. In his prophecy, he condemned kings Zedekiah, Shalom, Jehoiakim, and Coniah, and called for repentance from unrighteousness, from injustice, from cheating and idolatry, lest Babylon will overpower and destroy Judah. The reading today is a summary conclusion of this section. Jeremiah proclaims woe on the shepherds and declares the Lord's message that, one, since the shepherds have scattered the flock and not addressed their needs, the Lord will address the evil actions of the leaders. Two, the Lord, the good shepherd, will therefore gather these scattered flock and make them fruitful and multiply, a renewal of the promise in Genesis for humanity to be productive and multiply on the earth. And three, the Lord will replace the leaders with good shepherds, true kings who will care for the people. And four, the promised shepherd will reign as the ideal king over the house of David and bring about justice and righteousness in the land. And he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. In Hebrew, Yahweh Tzitkenu. This promise finds fulfillment in Jesus, the good shepherd from the royal house of David, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. So the name Zedekiah in Hebrew is Tzitkeyahu, which means Yahweh is righteous. Although the king's name was Mataniah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, changed his name from Mataniah to Zedekiah. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 17, which expresses confidence in God. He, however, never embodied righteousness in any way. So, since Zedekiah did not live up to the faith and confidence symbolized in his name, Jeremiah prophesies that the leader God wants for us, the true and promised king, would truly embody the righteousness of God, such that he will be called Yahweh Tzitkenu, the Lord is our righteousness. The second reading from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 13 to 18 focuses on the uniting and reconciling role of Christ, bringing together Jews and Gentiles who were once far off. The letter to the Ephesians is addressed apparently to believers in Christ of non-Jewish origins, placing a lot of emphasis on the elimination of the dividing wall and the ending of hostilities between Jews and Gentiles. 
In chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, which are the immediate two verses preceding the passage of our second reading, the author reminds the Gentile believers how they were first considered the uncircumcised by Jews who considered themselves the circumcised, how they were aliens to the commonwealth and covenantal promises of Israel. The verses that follow, which we have in the second reading, express how in Christ that situation has been reversed. In verse 13, we have a summary of the new order. Gentiles and Jews, once far off, have now been brought close together by the blood of Christ. Consequently, in verse 14, Christ is considered the personification of peace, having broken down walls of division and ended hostilities between Jews and Gentiles. As we read, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. In verses 15 to 16, we are told that Christ achieved his project of making peace and creating in himself one new humanity in place of the two through the abolition of the law with its commandments and ordinances. And deriving from this, he could reconcile both groups to God. As we read, he has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. In verses 17 to 18, which are the last two verses of our passage, we find a summary and a restatement of what has been said concerning Christ's project of making peace and bringing close peoples who were once far off. The law which Christ abolished in favor of making peace between Jews and Gentiles was a kind of law that made one people distinctively privileged and superior over and above another. The letter to the Ephesians insists on a new spiritual Israel that nullifies the advantages and privileges of Israel of the flesh over Gentiles. In Christ, both become sharers in the commonwealth and covenantal promises of Israel. Indeed, co-citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. As we reflect on the theme of leadership, the second reading invites leaders, therefore, to imbibe Christ's quality of dismantling divisive walls and laws that engender hostilities between peoples and rather build bridges that bring peoples together and become a personification of peace and reconciliation. We are also reminded that achieving peace and reconciliation between ourselves is a necessary step towards our reconciliation with God. Our gospel today is from Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 34. Last Sunday in the gospel, Jesus sent out the apostles on a mission. In today's gospel, they returned to Jesus to give an account, to give a report of what had happened. And the text says, Panta hosa e poyesan kai hosa e didasan. All they had done and taught. A poison refers to the miraculous works and a didazan to their teaching. The job of teaching was reserved for the didaskalos, the teacher. But Jesus gave the apostles the authority to teach in his name and even to perform miracles. Our first lesson is that the apostles owe their mission to the one who sent them and the report they gave is based on the works and teaching they performed in his name, in the name of Jesus. On their return, Jesus did not send them straight away into another mission, but he does something spectacularly different. He says to them, come and rest a while. The expression, kai e na pausaste oligon, means be refreshed or take rest a little. The idea of refreshing and resting suggests that they needed time to refill and to recharge their source of strength. They are to spend time with the master, the one who sends, to listen to him before they proceed to another mission. 
Rest in the spiritual life is synonymous with prayer and meditation. It is a time to rest in the Lord and to listen to Him. Otherwise, the apostles will become empty preachers without depth. They will be preaching their own message, not the message of the Master. The apostles had worked so hard that they had no time even to eat. And as they went off in a boat to a lonely place to be by themselves, the people saw them going and went ahead of them. The crowd arrived at a location before them, meaning that they knew where Jesus and his disciples wanted to rest. Another lesson we see and we learn from this passage is the response of Jesus to the people. As they stepped out of the boat and Jesus saw the large crowd, he had pity on them. Rather than rebuke or chase them away to have time to rest, he showed them compassion. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. A shepherd in Israelite culture cared for the sheep and gave them protection and leadership. The good shepherd is the one who protects the sheep from the enemy and guides, leads, feeds the sheep as we see in the responsorial psalm. Jesus teaches his disciples and wants them to be faithful and true shepherds who are compassionate leaders, good teachers and caregivers. And that is the role he is inviting all of us to play as members of his church and as his disciples in our world today. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page Devar Adonai or visit our website devaradonai.org.